We're going to continue our, our little series about before and after, a uh, series designed to help us look at our life uh, before we say we trusted Jesus and take a look at our life afterwards to see what kind of impression we're making on people. We're making impressions on people all the time, uh, but which way is that impression going? We make an impression for God or against God? And uh, to get you thinking about uh, the truth about making impressions, I want to tell you a true little story about an impression that I observed Joyce make uh, one night recently. Uh, we were on our way to a funeral home one evening uh, for a visitation. And if you're not familiar with how it's done in the South, that means the family of the deceased uh, often gathers at a funeral home the night before the funeral. And uh, they receive uh, visitors who... Uh, express their condolences and pay their last respects to the deceased who is usually present in that room in an open casket. It's called visitation. And so we were going uh, to a funeral home one night for that purpose, and we needed gas on the way, so we stopped to get gas. And while there, Joyce wanted a drink, so we went inside to get a drink. And we're waiting in line to pay for this drink. And this, this uh, older couple came to get in line to pay for something. And they, they were just... Uh, just sweet looking older couple and I don't know if there is such a thing as a stereotypical prim and proper and polite nice old southern couple but if there is such a thing that was this couple but the little old lady got in line in front of Joyce and uh, and her sweet husband he said now Mabel this sweet young lady was in line before we were and you could tell she didn't realize she had cut line and so as she's backing out of line just picture this little sweet white-haired couple, just as quiet and as nice as they could be. Here's what Joyce said to him, and she has no inside voice. Okay, so this is like an out, this is like a PA system in this convenience store. Okay, she says, "Oh, that's okay. We're not in any hurry. We're going to view a body at the funeral home. He's not going anywhere." This, this little, I, I wish I had it on camera, I'd be rich, I could sell it. But the faces on those two polite little southern people just went kind of, and they didn't say a word, they just backed away. <laughs> like, we got we to gotta get away from this crazy lady who talks like that. Well, Joyce obviously made an impression on them. The question is, what kind of impression did she make? But say, I tell you that story because that's a reminder to us that we are making impressions on people all the time. The question is the same, but what kind of impression are we making? You see, the Bible challenges us that if we're a believer in Christ, our lives should be different from before to after. The impression that I used to make before I knew that Jesus died for me and rose again and forgave my sins should be different than the impression I make today. And we're making an impression either for God or, or against him. The Bible says that the impression we should want to make as a believer in Christ is through Christ-like words and actions that the Bible calls the fruit of the Spirit. And, and that is how we exhibit, that is evidence that we have trusted Jesus. And as we go through this series where we're challenged to, to take a look at, at who we were before and, and who we are now, if you don't see any difference, that's a problem. And you should be asking yourself, why, Lord, why? Why do I claim to trust Jesus, but there's no difference? Or maybe you see just a little bit, but, it's, but God is convicting you that, that there's not enough difference in your life. We should be on our knees saying, God, why? Why? Help me. Help me to be more of an example and make more of an impression for you. And if you never have trusted Jesus Christ, I tell you, I've got one goal for you in this series is that you begin to see what a difference Jesus can make in your life and that perhaps in this hour here today you'll give your heart to him and let him begin to make that difference. Let's go back to our scripture for this series, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Galatians 5, 16. If you didn't bring your Bible, there, look around under a chair in front of you somewhere. There should be a little black hardcover Bible. You pick one of those up, you can open it to page 826. And that will get you in the neighborhood of Galatians chapter 5. You find verse 16. We're going to continue talking about before and after. 
Galatians 5.16, this little letter that was written by the great apostle Paul uh, to churches in a region called Galatia, and it was circulated amongst those churches. And in chapter 5, the part we're looking at, really the apostle Paul is reminding people to look back at who they were before Christ and who they are now, before and after. Galatians 5.16, Paul says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you won't gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They're in conflict with each other so that you don't do what you want. But if you're led to the spirit, you're not under the law. The effects of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, uh, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness and orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now remember where we've been so far. That, that, that this, all, this problem from before to after is, is still a problem now because there is this conflict in you if you're a believer in Christ. Verse 17 says there is a battle going on within every believer between the Spirit of God uh, whom he puts in you the moment you trust Jesus and our sinful nature. We are forgiven of our sins the moment we trust Jesus but there is a residual part of that, that inborn predisposition to sin called our sinful nature. That, that part of us that makes us just inclined to want to do what we want to do. That remains. And that won't be completely erased until heaven. And so until then, there's a battle. And we're listening to one voice or the other in that battle. And which one we listen to makes the difference into what kind of impression we're making on the people we encounter. And, and Paul said part of the solution is that, you know, until heaven, we're going to have this sinful nature. So he says in verse 16, part of the solution is uh, live, live by the Spirit. And you won't gratify the desires of the sinful nature. What Paul is saying, the more I learn to listen to God and to obey that voice instead of my sinful nature, the more I will limit the damaging effects of, of, of my sinful nature. And that means I've got to be more preoccupied with the things of God than I am with myself and my, and my selfishness and my sinful nature's desire because our sinful nature opposes everything that God wants us to do. For example, if, if you get to the end of this service today and we have this last song and people are invited to come and kneel and pray or to, to come and join this church or uh, to confess publicly that you've trusted Jesus, if you, if you experience the urging to do that, you will probably also experience, or, or maybe this little voice will say, don't do that. Wait till next Sunday. You don't, you don't really need to do that. That is the battle between the Spirit of God and the sinful nature. And we are listening to one or the other. And it depends on which one we're listening to, which kind of impression we make. Now last week we began looking at the fruit of the Spirit, which is the measuring rod for our life after we trust Jesus. We looked before at, at, at all of those sins that Paul wrote about in, in verses 19 through 21, and, and they're really not... It's not a complete list of sins, so don't take, uh, you know, don't breathe easy because your pet sin's not on that list, okay? Those are categories of sin. All of us fit in there somewhere. Those are things that the sinful nature produces. But that's before. Now we're looking at the measuring rod of after, and it's called the fruit of the Spirit. We looked at joy. We looked at love and joy last week. And as we move on examining our life after Christ, we move on and cover the rest of the fruit. Now, I'm going to cover it pretty quickly because I've done all the work for you. You've got one little blank on there by each one. I've already written the definitions out, so we're going to go quickly. I'll explain just a little bit. But what I want you to do is as you hear this and you hear each piece of this fruit of the Spirit named, I want us all to ask ourselves, God, do I show that fruit? And what is the, what is, how is that fruit seen in my life? For example, the next one is peace. Peace it starts on the inside and then spreads to the outside. And it has to start when we make peace with God through Jesus Christ. 
There's no hope of, of real peace until we are at peace the, with the one who made us by faith in, in the crucified, risen Lord Jesus. But once we make peace with God, it should have a spillover effect and people should begin to see the fruit of peace in our life. Because, because that means that we're going to, in general, with most people, we're going to have peaceful relationships. Now, I said in general. Unless you're perfect, you're never going to be perfectly peaceful all the time, okay? We're going to mess it up. And, and oh, by the way, we're not going to be at peace with everybody because the, the hard truth is there are some people in the world who don't want peace with you. I mean, that, that happens individually. It happens as, our, as a nation. There, there are people, groups, and countries in the world that really don't want peace with us. In fact, the Bible says in Romans 12, 18, as, as much as it depends on you, live peacefully with all people. So you do your part, but you can't do the other person's part. So this, this is reality. There are some people who the only measure of peace you're going to have with them is just stay away from them. Okay? Just stay away from them. And that's better than being around them and arguing all the time and being in conflict all the time. And so the question we should ask is, do we have a reputation for peace or for conflict? Are we known as a, a person who is easy to get along with or are we known as somebody who's always looking for a fight? Somebody who's always contentious, somebody who's always on edge look, looking for an argument. See, that'll answer the question whether or not we're displaying this fruit. The next fruit is patience. And, and, you know, the old prayer for patience is, Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now. Okay? But it, but it really doesn't work that way. And, and, and patience, in this sense, has a broader definition. It really means endurance. It means perseverance for God. This fruit of the Spirit shows up when, when God calls you to do something, you will not quit you will persevere and you won't stop doing it even when times get tough. And I'll tell you, from my chair as a pastor, and, and there, there's a, sometimes a shortage of people with patience. There, there are lots of Christian quitters. But, you know, this is if God calls you to do something, you won't stop doing it until he releases you from that call. And see, and then that shows up in how we treat other people because you, you then become known for your patience and, in, and your endurance with people and they begin to see this fruit. Kindness. Kindness is concern for people that leads to action. It is not the fruit of kindness if it doesn't lead you to do something about it. it, is, it, it feeling sorry for people is not kindness. Kindness. Kindness is only when you feel sorry and then you do something about that. This is action-oriented. This, for example, is it's one thing to know that there are people in our area who, uh, who are short on food. Kindness, for example, is when we know that and we just don't feel sorry for them, but we open a food pantry and we give them food. Kindness leads to doing something which should lead us to ask ourselves the question, Lord, how is the fruit of kindness showing up in my life? And, and that is, God, am I doing any kind acts or am I just sitting around feeling sorry for people? Because if you're not taking action to help somebody, it's not kindness. Goodness. Goodness is moral behavior. It is an ethical standard by which you live that is defined by God and not defined by the world. There are some things that are absolutely true all the time for all people, all places. There are some moral absolutes in this world. And they are true because God says they are true. And guess what? Television doesn't get to redefine biblical morality. It will try to. Movies don't get to tell you how to, to, to conduct yourselves in life. Your friends, my friends don't get to redefine morality and, and ethical behavior from me. My friends in the sight of God are not allowed to tell me what is right or wrong. God has already set that standard. I remember when I was a kid, my mom said something that used to irritate me. You know, when, when I would say, well, mom, everybody else is doing it. 
What, what am I saying? Well, everybody else is doing it, so I'm going to follow their definition of right and wrong. You know what my mom would say? Irritated me to death. Well, if everybody else went down to the river and jumped off the bridge, would you go too? I used to grit my teeth. Now I am her, because that's what I say. If everybody else did it, would you do it? You see, that, that is involved in goodness. God alone sets the standard for what is right or wrong and for what is good and bad. And the fruit of goodness is displayed when we follow God's definition of moral and ethical behavior in spite uh, of what the world says. And I tell you what, if you want to live by God's moral and ethical standards, you will in large part be swimming upstream in today's society. You will be swimming against the current. If you are trying to raise your children, parents, uh, according to the moral standards of God and display the, the fruit of goodness, you, you are asking your kids to swim upstream. Young people, when you go to school tomorrow, if you seek to display the fruit of goodness in your life in your school, you will probably be in the minority. But I pray for the strength for you to be in that minority and to display the, the, the fruit of goodness. And people will sometimes laugh at you, young people, because it's so old-fashioned to be good. And it's so out of date. I mean, everybody else is doing this. Go to school and be different. That's what this is about. And then we get to the fruit of faithfulness. Faithfulness is about your loyalty to God. Can God count on you? Can God trust you? And then it spills over to people. And we're either known as a, uh, as a person that, that can be relied on or we're not. We're known as a person of our word or, or we're not. We're known as a person who when we say we'll volunteer for something, we will do it and people can count on it. Or we're one of those people who when we say we'll do something, in the back of the people's mind I'm saying it too, they wonder if I really will. Can God and people rely on us? Faithfulness. Gentleness is the next fruit. It really should be translated humility. I would tell you right in humility because sometimes from the Greek to the, to the English it's a little bit difficult but it means more of, of humbling yourself first before God because if you humble yourself before God and, and once we realize who we are before God, guess what? That's going to spill over and how do we treat people and we're going to want to humble ourselves before people and put others first. But there's a part of this meaning here of, of what is listed as gentleness that I'm telling you is really humi humility. It also means that you're a teachable person. Humble people are teachable. You know, one of the ways you can ask yourself, am I displaying this fruit, is are you willing to ever listen and learn to people, learn from people? Do you know anybody who's always right? I know a few of those people. They're just always right. Godly counsel means nothing to them. Somebody who has more experience than they do and, and, and some godly advice means nothing to them. But why? Because they're not displaying the fruit of humility or gentleness. Because when you think you know it all, what are you displaying? the act of the sinful nature called pride. So we should ask ourselves, are, are we still in the business of learning? And I don't care how old or how young you are, if you're, if you're not willing to learn, something's wrong. And then we get to the fruit of self-control. If you look back at the acts of the sinful nature in verses 19 through 21 and kind of think about them one by one, Many of them are acts that exhibit a lack of self-control. They are acts of passion and excitement and, and emotion where the passion and the excitement and the desires and the emotions are ruling instead of us ruling them. And this fruit of self-control is where we learn to, to live by the Spirit to the point that we are not out of control but we are under control. It should lead us to ask ourselves questions like, am I known for somebody who maintains their cool 
Or am I known for somebody who, who flies as somebody who flies off the handle? Am I known as somebody with a quick temper and 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 somebody who's 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 easily uh, angered? Or am I known as somebody who knows how to keep those passions and desires under control? See, the, the fruit of self-control is where we learn to live by the Spirit and passions and desires and emotions that flow against God's plan for us are controlled. How many of you received a little packet of, of fruit candy when you came in today? Anybody get any? Okay. Now, if you already ate it, that's fine. I hope you still have the package. All right? It's okay if you ate it. But... Uh, now, if you're one of those uptight people that, you know, doesn't want to have any fun in church, just kind of get over yourself for a few minutes, okay? And, and, and let's do a little experiment here. Because uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call out the names uh, because every, every one of these packets has a fruit of the Spirit listed on it. I don't know if you noticed that or not. That's why it's fruit candy, fruit of the Spirit, get it? You know? I thought it was pretty cool. I found these in a Christian bookstore and bought them because that's what we're talking about, so... Every one of them has a fruit of the Spirit listed on it. And I'm going to call out each of them one at a time. And when I call out the fruit of the Spirit that is listed on your little packet of candy, I want you to just stand up. We'll see how many people got that packet, okay? So first one is love. That's the one I picked up randomly this morning. So if you've got the, the fruit candy of love in your hand, stand up. Lots of loving people in this room. All right, love, you may sit down. Joy, how many joyful people do we have in here? Thank God. You know, we only had one joyful person on this side of the room last service. I'm so thankful that we have some joyful people here. Thank you, Joy. You may sit down. Now, some of these may sound different than what I'm calling them. I'll, I'll give you two words uh, because the, some of these are different in the King James language than they are in the version we read from. And so uh, it may be different. Uh, like uh, patience is may be called long-suffering in the old King James. Anybody have a piece of patience candy? I, you got that? You, you did? Good. You're the only one who's had patience all morning. I think we got gypped on our candy. I think they left some fruit of the Spirit out of our candy, actually, because nobody's had patience so far. So, all right. Uh, uh, gentleness, which is kindness, Gentleness is in the King James. Kindness is what we read. Any kind people here today? Thank you. We need some kind people all around the room. Thank you. Kindness, you may be seated. Uh, goodness, any good people here today? Stand up if you got goodness. Not too many good people in this room. <laughs> I don't know what that's... I don't, we're going to have to have a prayer meeting or something. Uh, faith or faithfulness, whichever way it's listed, faith or faithfulness. What door did most of you people over here go in today? How did, you just didn't like candy or, or what? You didn't get one. Oh, my goodness. Okay, uh, meekness, which may be called also the humility. Any me we didn't have meekness in any service today. See, we, we got gypped on two fruits of the Spirit. We're going to have to write this company, okay? And then temperance, which is self-control. Old King James word, temperance. Any people under control here today? Thank you. All right. You may be seated. Uh, how many of you did not get the fruit of the Spirit today? Uh-oh. I don't know what that says about all of you. So I guess you're the ones that we need to pray for, right? No. Really, it just means you didn't get the candy. Uh, but let, let's pretend for just a minute. Let, let's pretend that these little packets really do represent the actual fruit of the Spirit. You see, peace. Did I skip peace? All right, all peaceful people stand up. I don't want to skip peace. Thank you. Okay, I feel better about some of you over here right now than I did before. Thank you, Penny, for reminding me. But what, what if this did represent the fruit of the Spirit. Did you know that every believer in this room should have stood up at least once? And hopefully a lot of us would have, would have stood up more than once because we'd be saying, Jesus has made a difference in my life and I'm not perfect at it and I mess it up all the time.
but there's some consistent display of fruit of the Spirit in my life. None of us always show all of the fruit, and none of us ever show it perfectly. But here's the truth. If we claim to be a believer in Jesus Christ, sometime, somewhere, in some way, somehow, in some place, somebody will see the fruit of the Spirit in our life. And if they don't, then we should be asking ourselves why. Why is there no difference in my life? You know, only Jesus always perfectly showed all of the fruit of the Spirit. But if we learn to live by the Spirit, it says we won't gratify the desires of the sinful nature, which means we will show more of the fruit and we will show it more consistently. 